On August 19th, a truck packed with explosives blew up part of the compound, killing at least 20 people, including Sergio Vieira de Mello, the UN's High Commissioner in Iraq. In November, 16 American soldiers died after their Chinook helicopter crashed near the Saddam stronghold town of Fallujah. By December, more than 500 coalition troops and personnel had died in Iraq since the start of the war. A relatively small number compared to an estimated 10,000 Iraqi civilians who are thought to have lost their lives. Post-war fighting took another cruel twist when 18 Italians were killed in a bomb blast at their base in Nazaria. It was the deadliest attack on any U.S. ally since the occupation began, but it didn't stop there. Japanese, South Koreans, Spanish and Colombians joined the growing list of fatalities. Turkey paid a heavy price for its support of the U.S. On November 15th, suicide bombers struck two synagogues in Istanbul, killing 25 people. And five days later, the headquarters of banking giant HSBC and the British consulate in Istanbul were similarly attacked, leaving 30 dead and hundreds injured. Suspicion fell on the Al-Qaeda terror network. To boost morale, Bush made a surprise brief appearance in Baghdad on Thanksgiving Day. Washington has promised to speed up the handover of power to the Iraqis, saying some form of elections could be held in the first half of 2004. But as this year drew to a close, a number of key questions remained unanswered. Now that Saddam is behind bars, will the insurgency die out, making a power transfer easier? How will Saddam's fate be decided? And who will control Iraq and its vast oil reserves? Here in Asia, China officially ushered in a new generation of leaders and the mainland took an increasingly important role in the international diplomatic arena. China became more involved in trying to sort out the North Korean nuclear crisis and to cap it all, the mainland joined an elite club of spacefaring nations. Tracy Bond reports. The North Korean nuclear standoff with the US ebbed and flowed throughout the year. Early in the year, the reclusive state pulled out from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Then it sent shockwaves throughout the global community by restarting its nuclear reactor at Yongbyon. North Korea insisted the move was necessary to generate electricity after the U.S. stopped oil aid, but the world feared the worst. We are uh, looking for North Korea to visibly and verifiably dismantle its nuclear programs, and we have no intent to uh, invade the North. But Pyongyang said it didn't trust the U.S. and demanded a non-aggression treaty in return for the suspension of its nuclear program. The U.S. said it would not give in to blackmail. We are prepared to engage with the North Koreans, and we're prepared to talk to them. But what we can't find ourselves in the position of doing is essentially uh, panicking at their activities. Tension increased after a North Korean fighter jet invaded South Korea's airspace. A few days later, North Korea test-fired a missile which came down in the sea between the Korean Peninsula and Japan. Beijing hosted three days of talks between North and South Korea, the US, Japan, Russia and China. Although nothing concrete came of the talks, it was an example of China's growing involvement in international affairs. It wasn't only the nuclear standoff that marked a landmark year for China. In March, President Jiang Zemin handed over power to Hu Jintao and a new generation of leaders. But he retained considerable influence by taking on the country's top military post. Wen Jiabao took over as premier from Zhu Rongji, who said one of the biggest challenges facing the country was poverty in rural areas. Hu Jintao's first real political crisis as president came during the SARS epidemic. Beijing was criticized by the international community for covering up the severity of the outbreak on the mainland. Hu took matters into his own hands and instructed local authorities to come clean on how badly SARS had hit their areas to prevent the disease from spreading further. The May 1st Labor Day holidays, when millions of people traditionally clogged the country's road and rail networks, were cancelled to contain the outbreak. Hu raised his public profile as a man of the people, visiting SARS-hit areas. After SARS was brought under control, it didn't take China long to bounce back. The biggest morale booster was the success in putting China's first man into space. 
Details of the historic mission were kept under wraps until the very last minute. But in mid-October, the Shenzhou 5 carrying Yang Li Wei blasted off from the Jichuan launch site in the western Gobi Desert. Yang became an instant national hero, and all eyes were on him as he orbited the Earth 14 times before touching down safely on the grasslands of Inner Mongolia, just five kilometers away from his intended target. The successful mission energized China's space program, and officials announced plans to land an astronaut on the moon by 2020. That may have renewed U.S. interest in space exploration after the Columbia shuttle disaster. The Americans are now planning a manned mission to either the moon or even further afield, to Mars. Sino-U.S. ties warmed considerably as the year drew to a close. Premier Wen Jiabao made his first official trip to the U.S. and got George Bush to issue a stern warning to Taiwan against independence. We oppose any unilateral decision by either China or Taiwan to change the status quo. The comments followed new legislation in Taiwan, allowing the island to hold referendums on contentious issues like changing Taiwan's official name, flag and territory. Despite Bush's warning, Taiwan leader Chen Shui-bian said he would go ahead with plans to hold a vote on the mainland's anti-ballistic missiles pointed at the island to coincide with presidential elections in March next year. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, we'll take a look at a landmark 12 months for the Middle East, some of the world's worst disasters, and all of the top sports stories of the year. The crisis, the conflict, the people, the politics. A look at the events that shaped Hong Kong in the past 12 months on Crown Prince Hotel Dongguan Special. 2003, the year that was at home. Tonight at 8.30. Hello, I'm Name Your Own Price. With Priceline, I'm always on holiday and I save so much money. And you? Mean, I'm choosy. Hello, choosy. No, no, I mean I get to choose my own airline. Oh, choose your own airline? And I still get the savings. <laughs> so far. You're new and exciting. I like you a lot. Priceline. Two, Two smarter, smarter ways to save. We are live from the literal games at Ocean Park. Tubing from way up high, this guy's going all out for speed. Whoa! Do you think he'll make it? It doesn't look good. He's losing it. He's losing it. Oh man, I don't think I can watch this. I think even you could do better than that one. Let's check in on the Olympic stars showing their stuff on the next slope. It's all happening at the Ocean Park Winter O Games, December 19th through January 4th. See you there. Would it take something like this to make you understand? Dig it, shove it, move every rock, leave no stone unturned. Remember, when you get into the subtleties of pterosaur identification, even the smallest clues become conclusive evidence. And get those suspects in line. The inquest begins on the big monster dig, Friday night at 9.
back. The Iraq war dominated world events in 2003, but there were other key turning points that made the year a memorable one on the political front. These were some of the scenes from another frustrating year in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Both sides agreed to disagree as the peace process stumbled from one deal to another, most notably the US-backed roadmap to peace. The Holy Land must be shared between the state of Palestine and the state of Israel, living at peace with each other and with every nation of the Middle East. But there was no breakthrough. Retaliatory strikes peaked when 15 people died in an attack on a bus in the Israeli port of Haifa. Israel responded with a devastating raid in the Gaza Strip. A major stumbling block is Israel's insistence in building a highly controversial West Bank barrier. Ahmed Kiraya replaced Mahmoud Abbas as Palestinian Prime Minister in November, but Yasser Arafat continued as leader, frustrating the Israelis who at one stage threatened to kill him. The long-running Palestinian uprising is now in its fourth year, with no immediate end in sight. There was a happier outcome to fierce civil war in Liberia. President Charles Taylor eventually agreed to leave the capital Monrovia and go into exile, but the violence ended only after the United Nations took over command of the peacekeeping force. Taylor is now on Interpol's wanted list for war crimes and crimes against humanity committed during the Sierra Leone War. Georgian President Edward Shevardnadze, who had led the former Soviet Republic since the end of the Cold War, was forced to resign in what's now being called the country's Velvet Revolution. The opposition stormed Parliament during a key session in November. Shevardnadze's downfall was triggered by parliamentary elections in November, which the opposition claims were rigged. The jury is still out on Philippine President Gloria Arroyo. Discontent against her government led to a coup attempt by a group of military officers on a fateful Sunday in July. The rebels surrendered 15 hours later, but the uprising clearly shows Arroyo is now losing support among her people, ahead of next year's presidential election. Asia's longest serving leader, Malaysian Premier Mahathir Mohamad, called it a day. The outspoken leader retired after 22 years at the helm, but not before he took one more shot at Jews and Western interests. And Hollywood actor Arnold Schwarzenegger could not have scripted the Californian elections for governor any better. He took over from Gray Davis and set about trying to revive the cash-strapped state. 2003 also had its setbacks. NASA's space program came to an abrupt halt when the shuttle Columbia broke apart on returning from a mission. Seven astronauts died. And that was just one of a series of disasters that included earthquakes, typhoons and fires that ensured the world would see its share of tragedy, both natural and man-made. It was a sight as spectacular as it was tragic. A trail of fire shooting across the February sky over the state of Texas. Streaking through the atmosphere at 18 times the speed of sound, the space shuttle Columbia broke up just 15 minutes before its scheduled landing in Florida. All seven astronauts on board were killed, including the first Israeli in space. The disaster grounded NASA's space shuttle program. After months of investigation, officials concluded that a piece of Columbia's foam insulation had fallen off during the launch, ripping a hole in the left wing and triggering the disaster during the shuttle's return. Investigators also exposed shortcomings on the part of NASA, saying it had done little to improve safety since the loss of another shuttle, the Challenger, in 1986. Houston now control. There was more tragedy in the U.S. in February. A rock concert at a Rhode Island nightclub turned into a raging inferno that killed 100 people. It was supposed to be a spectacular show by the heavy metal band Great White, but pyrotechnics used by the group ignited a fast-moving fire, feeding on foam insulation that had been used as soundproofing behind the stage and sending flames shooting through the one-story wooden building. Ten months later, a grand jury indicted three people on charges of involuntary manslaughter, including the tour manager of the band. The lights went out for America in August. It was the worst blackout in U.S. history, plunging up to 50 million people in darkness. The blackout cut across a huge slice of North America, 
knocking out power from the East Coast to the Midwest and Southern Canada in just seconds. The shutdown of power came without warning, driving millions of people outdoors into the summer heat. It was a wake-up call to upgrade a third world power system being used by the first world. It was a terrible year for Europe as well. A blistering heat wave swept across the continent this summer, claiming lives on a shocking scale and causing a breakdown in one of the world's best health systems. Some estimates put the death toll at 20,000. France bore the brunt of it, with hospitals swamped with victims, especially the elderly. And the government came under fire for failing to react fast enough to the crisis. There were other disasters around the world, man-made and natural, but one eclipsed them all, coming at the end of the year, just when it looked like the worst was over. A powerful earthquake hit southeast Iran last week, destroying most of the historic city of Bam, about 1,000 kilometers from the capital, Tehran. The quake, measuring 6.3 on the Richter scale, struck just before dawn, when most people were still asleep. Officials put initial estimates at 20,000 dead and 30,000 injured, but warned that the final figures would be much higher. On a brighter note, there was plenty to shout about in the world of sports. England's crowning moment at the Rugby World Cup dominated the international stage, and it was action all the way in European soccer. The year saw a resurgence of Italian teams in the Champions League. AC Milan and Juventus faced each other in the final at Old Trafford. Juventus having dumped defending champions Real Madrid out of the competition in the semis. After a goalless draw, it was Milan who came out on top, winning 3-2 on penalties. Madrid went on to take the Spanish league, but it wasn't enough to save Vincente Del Bosque's job as manager, and he was sacked. Madrid brought in Manchester United's deputy coach Carlos Queiroz, and in a wave of publicity and hype, added United midfielder David Beckham to their books. International football saw the wrap-up of Euro 2004 qualifiers, Turkey one of the biggest names not to make next year's tournament. France won the Confederations Cup, beating Cameroon 1-0, although the tournament was marred by the tragic death of Mark Vivian Foe. Germany won the Women's World Cup, beating Sweden 2-1 in the final. In Formula One, it was Michael Schumacher who prevailed, winning the championship for Ferrari. Despite strong challenges from Kimi Raikkonen and Juan Pablo Montoya, they couldn't prevent the German from taking a record sixth championship. In cycling, Lance Armstrong won his record fifth straight Tour de France. In tennis, a new order emerged, although you'd be forgiven for thinking it was more of the same when Andre Agassi beat Rainer Schuttler to claim his fourth Australian Open title. In the women's game, the year saw the rise of another dynamic duo. Not the Williams sisters, but the Belgian pair of Justine hennen Arden and Kim Kleisters. Serena Williams won Wimbledon, but injury and the murder of her sister hampered her efforts. In golf, Tiger Woods finished his first season without a major trophy, as all four majors went to first-time winners. One of the most memorable victories was Ben Curtis's British Open triumph. Ranked 396 going into the competition, the American became the lowest-ranked major winner in history. The year had its share of World Cups. Australia dominated the cricket in South Africa, beating India by 154 runs in the final. And the Aussies came close to winning the Rugby World Cup as well but they were beaten by a formidable England side, 2017, in a nail-biting final. It was England's first major sporting triumph since winning the Football World Cup in 1966. There are a lot of memories to take away from 2003. Some of the highlights include Roger Federer's Wimbledon win and England's Rugby World Cup triumph. Next year sees Euro 2004 and the Athens Olympics. And no doubt, there'll be more incidents and triumphs and memories to talk about. And finally, let's take time to remember some of those who left us in the past year. Some will be remembered for all the wrong reasons, like former Ugandan dictator Idi Amin. During eight murderous years as president of Uganda, Amin was responsible for an estimated 300,000 deaths. Amin died on August 16th at the age of 78. Others who died in the past 12 months were loved around the world. And to them, we say, thanks for the memories. I give you this, a tender kiss, of it's more valuable than dough, and I thank you, and Charles when the preacher said, for better or for worse. It was, thanks for the memory of Schubert's serenade, 
Little things of jade And traffic jams and anagrams And bills we never paid How lovely it was We who could laugh over big things Were parted by only a slight thing I wonder if we did the right thing Oh well, that's life, I guess I love your dress Do you? It's pretty Thanks for the memory Of faults that you forgave Rainbows on a wave And stockings in the basin When a fellow needs a shave <laughs> Thank you so much Thanks for the memory Of tinkling temple bells Alma mater yell And Cuban rum and towels From the very best hotels Oh, how lovely it was the memory of cushions on the floor hashed with Diddy Moore that pair of gay pajamas well, as we have just seen, 2003 was indeed a monumental year for international news. My colleague Yondan Latu will be here in the next 30 minutes to look at the people and the politics that shaped Hong Kong in the past 12 months. From me, Nick Waters, Happy New Year. Prince Hotel Dongguan Special 2003, the year that was abroad, was sponsored by Crown Prince Hotel Dongguan. Doing their thing to bury the other side.